upside down And I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air Born and raised on the playground was where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, flexing, relaxing, off, cooling off, shooting some people outside of a school. And a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. I got in one little fight and my mom got scared. She said, You're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. I whistle for a cab and when it came near the license plate said, Fresh it up. What's up, everyone? We're going to get started in a minute. Shout out to our guest for another amazing intro song. About seven or eight, and I yelled to the cabbie, Your home, see you later. I looked at my kingdom, I was finally there. Sit on my throne as the Prince of Bel Air. Well, that was awesome. Uh, we are going to get started. Thank you to our guest for the Fresh Prince of Bel Air music. What a throwback. And thank you to the Morning Brew team for the amazing graphics that just get keep getting better every single week that we do this show. Uh, we're going to hop right into it. What is up, everyone? This is Alex Lieberman, co-founder and CEO of Morning Brew, coming to you with another edition of my CMO series, where I interview the smartest marketers in the world about the strategies, tactics, and trends leveraged to become titans of industry. A uh, few housekeeping items that we always start with. The first is this is a conversation, not just an interview. So as you hear interesting things being said or things that confuse you by uh, our guest or myself, just include them in the comments, literally just write in the comments, any questions that come to mind. And we're going to make sure to reserve a lot of time at the end to answer your questions. Second, if you are in marketing, which you probably are if you're watching the show, I'd encourage you to sign up for Marketing Brew, the one-stop shop newsletter that breaks down the biggest news in marketing. It's sent Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays by Phoebe Bain, and there will be a link uh, to sign up either in the comments or the live show description. Now for today's guest, Ross Simmons is the founder of Foundation, a content marketing agency that combines data and creativity to develop and serve ambitious B2B brands. He's a content marketing guru with massive followings on Twitter as well as LinkedIn. Ross, good to have you here. You ready to do this thing? Ready to do it, Alex. Thanks for having me on. There's nothing better than starting an interview with the Fresh Prince theme track. So thank you for the team. It, it was an epic recommendation. <laughs> uh, so I want to start with this. Can you tell me more about what Foundation is and why you are uniquely qualified to talk about content and search engine marketing? Definitely. So Foundation is a content marketing agency that services B2B brands. We work primarily with everything from uh, the fastest up and coming startups focused primarily in the wonderful world of SaaS all the way through to publicly traded manufacturing companies. Uh, I started my career in the wonderful world of marketing, uh, got obsessed very quickly with the idea of marketing actually generating business results. And in the world of B2B, you can really quickly see the results that you're generating for clients. And it just was something that I fell in love with. So I wanted to create a career around that. And that's what Foundation is. So Foundation works with these companies to do three things. We strategize, plan, we create content, and then we distribute that content. Um, we've worked with brands all over the world and have reached millions of people through the content the efforts that we bring to life. Awesome. So I want to start this out like it is a lecture. You are Professor <laughs> Simmons, and we are about to get a master class in content marketing. So we're going to start with foundational knowledge and then talk about how you apply this or how you see brands apply this. Uh, apply this. Let's uh, let's talk about this concept that you brought up a number of times around content as an asset and mm -hmm. thinking about getting dividends out of that asset. Can you talk about what the hell that means and why it's so important for marketers to get this concept? Definitely. I'd love to. So I think fundamentally, we oftentimes forget the fact that every single time you create a piece of content, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a Periscope video, whether it's a tweet, whether it's a YouTube video, a podcast recording, whatever, you are creating an asset. And the same way that we invest in assets in our personal financial portfolio, brands are investing in assets with one of two things, either money that they're contracting owed to others to create the content for, or they are spending their time. And those are the two things that you can invest in. When you invest in creating that asset, you need to generate results from that asset. It could be generating leads. It could be generating backlinks. It could be generating impressions. It could be generating sales. At the end of the day, you want to generate something from the investment that you are making. Here's what a lot of marketers forget. 
Every single asset is different, the same way that a stock is different from a bond, the same way that real estate is different from crypto. All of these different investments in the finance world are very similar to the different investments that you can make in the content world. An ebook is going to have a different goal than a listicle blog post. A listicle blog post is going to have a different goal from a podcast, etc. So when you are investing in these things, you have to be thinking about in the back of your mind, what is the outcome that I want from this? If you create a blog post today and the goal is SEO, the outcome that you want might be a long-term play around generating search traffic for currently a term that is low value. So um, 10 years ago, if you created a blog post that was the everything to know about cryptocurrency and you created that asset, it's going to be worth a lot more today over time because it had time to exist on the internet. It had time to see that demand for that keyword to go up. So what I think we oftentimes forget is that as CMOs, as marketers, et cetera, look at every asset that you create as an investment and think about how you can get an ROI from that investment long term, rather than always thinking about them as an expense. And when you do that, when you do have that fundamental shift in your thinking, you no longer press publish and then call it quits. You no longer say, I published this blog post, it's over you now start to think about, okay, how can I get more out of this? And you start to distribute that content more intentionally long-term. And that's when the ROI and the magic really starts to happen. Absolutely. So, you know, you hit on this concept of you create a piece of content and you don't just think of it as a cost. You think about it as an investment. But I think yeah. the other thing that you've talked a lot about is this idea of not just basically creating the content and then setting it and forgetting it. Like that isn't the only piece yeah. of the investment. There's these four words that you've used uh, in LinkedIn posts where you said, create once, distribute forever. Yeah. Can you talk about like your philosophy around the importance of distribution as the internet has just gotten more crowded with content? hundred percent. I think for the last few years, the writing has been on the wall that Google is making all of our lives harder as well as Facebook. When you look at 2016, the amount of reach that you could get when you put up a post on your Facebook account, it was significant. You could reach all of your followers. It was a great time. It was an amazing time to be a marketer. Similarly, two years ago, you put up a post on Instagram, you could reach all of your followers. But as algorithms have changed, it is no longer a world where we can all preach at the top of our lungs like the gurus have done. Content is cre king. Create more content and you will win. It doesn't work that way, right? Like if you even look at the search engine results page on Google, for the most part, they're not always just trying to send people. If I typed into Google the best books to read in 2020, they're going to actually show me the books right there. They're not going to send me to a blog post. So what does right. that mean? It means that it is becoming more and more difficult to actually get your content in front of your audience. It's also a more cluttered and noisy time than ever before. There's more content being created than ever before. We all have these devices that allow us to create content and develop content. Brands have heard at the top of the guru's lungs create more content and they've listened. Because of that, it has never been harder to stand out. So what do brands need to do? They need to embrace distribution. For years, we've embraced Shota to Wu-Tang for this acronym, but cream content rules everything around me. I believe that whole idea is dead, right? Like it's now distribution rules everything around me. You create that asset once, and then you have to have a distribution engine around it that is going to allow that asset to be spread for months to come, whether it's sponsoring a newsletter, whether it's spreading that content through influencers, whether that's taking that piece of content and reformatting it into a, a sub Reddit and turning it into a post on there or answering questions on Quora and plugging your content in. We always need to be thinking about how you can distribute that piece of content after it's press published instead of just calling it quits once it's done. Uh, yeah, I think this is just such a profound idea that I think, you know, has been articulated by really smart marketers like yourself in different ways. This idea of just like squeezing all of the juice out of the lemon and extracting all the value as as much as you can around great content. I actually yeah. want to talk about that in practice because I think it can be overwhelming for people to think about, okay, I create this piece of content. Yeah. What do I do now? Like, where do I distribute it? There's hundreds of options of where to distribute it. And how do I build a scalable process around this? Great so question. Let, let's just even use like this interview as an example, right? Like, so the, the first part of this is, you know, hopefully we're having an engaging conversation that's providing evergreen utility that people are watching this, but then hopefully there's referential value for them to come back and reference some of the stuff that you're saying about how to be smarter about content marketing. Right. But let's say after this interview is done, you're thinking about a content marketing distribution strategy of this interview for yourself and for the, the Ross Simmons brand. Right. How, would, how would you start thinking about basically yeah. where, where to place bets and how to kind of scale up this strategy? 
Great question. So I think it starts with having channel user fit. So you need to have channel user fit, which is knowing that the users that you're trying to reach, the people you're trying to connect with are using a specific channel. So I've already done the research. I know that my audience is likely on LinkedIn. I know my audience is likely browsing networks like Hacker News. I know that my audience is probably on Twitter. And I know that my audience is in a very variety of different Slack communities where marketers come together and discuss their efforts and growth, et cetera. Okay, so once I have channel user fit, I now have to look for content market fit. How do I uh, get content market fit? I'm gonna look back at this recording and see when were people pressing thumbs up? When were people giving hearts on Periscope, et cetera? Because those are moments when people resonated with the content. So then I'm going to go into a stage where it's like, okay, now I need to remix this content and then give it to these communities. Each community is gonna be different. Some of those communities are gonna want written words. So I'm going to get somebody to transcribe what I said at one minute and 40 seconds, all the way through to three minutes and 42 seconds, turn that into a written piece of content, copy and paste it, share it into a subreddit and say, hey, subreddit, uh, subreddit, our entrepreneurs, I've gotten so much value out of this community for the last little bit. I wanted to share with you an idea that I talked about with Alex from Morning Brew that I think you're going to love. Check it out, let me know what you think. I copy and paste that into the subreddit, press submit, share it, the comments come in, people love it, et cetera. I build relationships. I take that same piece of content. I share it on Hacker News. I take that same piece of content. I go to a forum on AngelList and I submit it over there. I then take that same concept and I record a video of me saying the exact same thing that I said, but as an Instagram story. It then goes on my Instagram story. People start engaging there. Then I reach out to my team and say, this piece of content is getting so much love, guys. We need to turn this into a carousel that I can post on my Instagram and my feed. And that is also the inspiration that's gonna go into a SlideShare presentation that goes up on SlideShare and is then sent to a handful of prospects that have been in our pipeline for the last few months. That's essentially the model, right? Like that's the model yeah. that you embrace. You have to understand what type of content your audience would want, know where your audience is, and then give it to them over and over again um, until they're tired of it, and then you create something new. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just so much that was just packed into that example. Like to, honestly, for anyone who's listening, who cares about marketing and distribution in the internet age, like yeah. seriously, just play back the last minute and a half that Ross said about all of the ways that you think about squeezing all of the juice out of the lemon. I've one nuanced question about that, which is like, you talk about all these different ways to distribute content, written content on hacker news, on a subreddit, creating a video on Instagram about this video. Yeah. You're one person. How do you right. scale yourself? Like, is this done through freelancers? Is this done right. through your team? Like what is, what is the machine you've built around yourself? hundred percent. So if you were to rewind five years ago, it was the Ross Simmons show just working until 3 a.m. doing it myself. Now I have a team and a process in place where the team would be assisting with it. So like right now I've got a newsletter that's going out in probably like the next 20 minutes that's going to hit my inbox, which is essentially a LinkedIn update that I shared two months ago. And the team just took it, reformatted, added some links, put some visuals into it, and are going to send that out to our email list. So I have a team now that does it. When we work with clients, we actually do provide that service, but we also um, help do what we call content culture. So we assist organizations with shaping their internal content culture around the processes that will actually work in the future. So we have helped organizations create entire content engines within their team, where they have a team of content creators and also content distributors. And yep. then those distributors are taking that content after it's press published and their job is to spread it. So it depends on your scale. I do believe if you're a one person shop, you can do this your own, but don't sleep on the fact that like there's never been a better time to actually engage other people to do content creation and repurposing efforts for you. Upwork, Fiverr, those sites are a beautiful thing when you are up in when you're young and early in your career trying to get running, uh, you can find some amazing talent on sites like Dribble, uh, Three Bs. Uh, you can find some amazing talent on Behance, et cetera. And you can find these folks to turn your content into videos, turn your content into transcriptions, et cetera. So uh, don't be afraid to get some assistance on it as well. And I would truly advise folks to make a budget line in it all for it. Like even as an individual freelancer, like when I was just getting started, I said, I need to invest actual revenue from the top line, like into yep. distributing my content. And I think people don't do that and it's a mistake. I, I uh, you know, using the example of Gary V, I believe his and he has a team around him uh, right. that I've heard effectively cost seven figures of right. his role a year. Yeah. And if you actually think about Gary, he doesn't monetize his brand through advertising. It's all top of funnel for all of his other businesses. Like yeah. he's literally just spending millions of dollars a year to build right. a top of funnel and get 
this content flywheel going that you're talking about. Yeah. One, one other question I have about this topic is the idea of you create a piece of content, you have a distribution strategy to milk all of the value out of it. But yeah. we live in an age where so much of the content we create is not for an audience we necessarily own, right? Like you distribute content on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. Ultimately, there is a gatekeeper between you and the consumer, even with honestly Google search and any algorithm changes that can happen through that. So how do you reconcile this idea of the need to be everywhere in an internet age, but also in a lot of these places that you distribute content through, you don't truly own the relationship? Yeah, great question. So I think there's two elements here that we need to, to recall and understand. Um, my dad always had this saying that he would say to me and my sister uh, all the time. He said, it's better to have one good kid than two bad ones. Yeah. So as long as one of you come out okay, I'm good. We're both great. We're both great kids. Showed it to my sister. She's probably watching this. Um, but I think the same methodology needs to work with your distribution efforts too. Like I would hate for somebody who's watching this to be like, I need to use Reddit, Medium, Quora, Slack, et cetera, et cetera, right away. Calm down, like take a step back, become really, really good at one channel and then start to increase the amount of items that you start distributing your your, uh, your content through. After you crack Reddit, then you can start moving on to Quora. After you crack Quora, then you can start going on to LinkedIn. But you have to start with the fundamentals of being really, really good at one first. So that's the first element of this that I think is important. The next piece around ownership. I believe you do have to have some type of ownership around the relationship between you and your audience. It's very important. And yes, algorithms are going to throw you a wrench if you rely on rented space. So what I always advise is that folks think about things like SMS. They think about things like email. They start to think about creating their own Slack community where people can actually join that and have a conversation with them. Those are the areas where you can actually own the relationship and it gives you direct access to people. So yes, 100%, you want to have something that you can send folks to that ultimately allows you to own that relationship in some way. Yeah, a hundred percent. So when you think about you, like your own personal brand and your growth as a brand, what was the first platform that you made a bet on? Like what was the first platform you focused on and what, why did you decide there first? Great question. So I think it was probably 10 years ago now, but I made a bet on SlideShare and this the platform today is not necessarily used. Most people don't even like a lot of the newbies in the game don't even know what SlideShare is. But back then, SlideShare was a place where you would upload a presentation and it was a good channel for B2B. Uh, but most people were uploading ugly presentations. They weren't putting any stories in them. They were just uploading their decks essentially from internal. So what I did was a little bit different. I actually invested um, a lot of time and energy and money into actually hiring designers to take all of my old blog posts and turn them into slides and make them ridiculously beautifully like designed and have stories going throughout the entire thing. And when I went public with one of my first one, I think it was the ultimate guide to Snapchat. And this was when Snapchat just launched. Yep. Um, it took off. It got hundreds of thousands of shares. I went to a conference and somebody told me that they taught uh, P. Diddy how to use Snapchat using my presentation. Wild. Like ready to quit my career. I was like, life is <laughs> like this is amazing. Um, but I just doubled down on creating amazing content for SlideShare and I was able to generate millions of leads, um, millions of revenue just from doing that. Uh, and it took off, like my career took off after I experimented with the channel that everybody else was sleeping on. And I continued to do that over time. I experimented with Instagram back in 2016, I was able to build an e-commerce site on the back of that. Um, everybody said, marketers don't touch Reddit. I was like, nah, I got this. I'm going to go into Reddit. I got banned twice. Don't get me yeah. wrong. You did get banned, but I came back, figured out the game, and now I can generate millions of visits from Reddit every single day. Without uh, it, like, I believe on, it. On the note of Reddit, I feel like that's such a hard platform, or at least yeah. like theoretically it is because Redditors are so allergic to yeah. promotion. So yeah. how, 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 have you, how have you leveraged that platform in a way that's not – self-promotional but drives like like you're talking about in the beginning actually specific down funnel goals that you want Great question yeah so there's a few ways we've done this with clients we've done this for our own self to just like experiment as well so let me give you a rundown on how it's done every different subreddit is different there's a subreddit about barbecue there's a subreddit about coffee there's a subreddit about marketing there's a subreddit about technology each of those different subreddits are going to have their own different code of ethics so to speak in some subreddits you can't just submit a link and call it a day you're gonna get banned, you're gonna get kicked out. Some subreddits require images to be the thing that you upload. 
First, you have to start by understanding what the rules of the game are within these different subreddits. How do you figure out then, once you understand like, okay, these are the things that I can and cannot do, how do you figure out what content people want? On every subreddit, you have the ability to sort content by the top posts. When you sort content by the top posts of all time, you are able to get the most insightful information around what communities actually want on a certain topic. You then scan all of that content and you start to look for trends. For example, if you go into the subreddit Futurology, you'll notice that for the vast majority of those posts, they're talking about Elon Musk. What does that mean? It means that if you are going to create a post, you're going to create 20 lessons that you learned studying um, the last 10 years of Elon Musk's career, and you submit that to that community, and you know that it's in a format that they like, you know that it's in a way that there's not gonna get you banned, and there's no link that is explicitly saying, just visit this on my website, guarantee you, you're making the front page. You're making the front page every single time. All you have to do is reverse engineer what has worked in the past. I call it the Sherlock Homeboy approach, but it's essentially the whole concept of reverse engineering. But you just sort the content by top posts, see what people want, and you'll be surprised. Like I want some folks who are watching this to think about your own URL. At the top of Reddit, if you type in site colon and then any domain and you hit enter, you are then able to see the top posts that have ever been shared on Reddit around your domain. You might be pleasantly surprised to see what content you already have published in the past that people on Reddit love. So what do you do? You see that you went viral on Reddit three years ago, you recreate that post and you submit it back to that community three years later and you do it again the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year after that. That's essentially the model. You reverse engineer what's working and then you give it to people over and over again with different approaches. So I wanna think about this outside of Reddit, but I also just wanna call out the fact that uh, I think Sherlock Homeboy is one of the best things I've heard all week. Um, <laughs> So uh, like you said on Reddit, like it's pretty easy to sort or like to sort and basically sift through yeah. what does a specific community really give a shit about and then create content based on that, those learnings. Exactly. Let's talk about something like, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn. Yeah. I think a big thing that you've talked about in the past is the idea of like creating content based on what your audience tells you what they want. But right. I think sometimes it's more obvious than other times actually to figure out what your audience actually wants. Yeah. On these given platforms, how are you basically iterating on yourself to understand what people want from you? Yeah, so I rely heavily on analytics. So I know that the a lot of marketers, uh, and this is something that a lot of CMOs get mad at me for saying, but like I truly think that marketing is more like investing than it is like art. And the reason why I say this is because there's a lot of data that you can essentially extract to get very crystal clear insights around what you should create in the past. It's not always just throwing paint at the wall and hoping something works. If I go back into analytics and I look at over the last three months, these are the tweets that resonated and hit in terms of like my audience. Guess what I'm going to do more of? content just like that. I sent out a tweet this morning that it was the exact same tweet I sent out in 2019, but there's new people following me in 2020. So those people never saw that tweet before. Tons of people are engaging with it. Tons of people are having conversations around it. I think that you can look at content that has worked in the past as the best prediction of what's going to work in the future, the same way that stocks work, right? Like you can see if a company is going up and to the right and they have great fundamentals, then it's probably going to be an okay investment in the future. Similarly, if I see that a certain format is working for you, like if I looked at your Twitter account and I saw, okay, Alex is doing these Periscope things, he's doing this, and they're generating a lot of engagement. Do I have alignment with his audience and my audience? Are we trying to reach the same people? The answer is yes. The next question is, okay, how can I create something similar to that? Uh, what would that look like? Yeah. Another thing that people underestimate though is to go to a completely different space. So like, you know how on Twitter, there's sports Twitter, there's yeah. C Twitter, there's marketing Twitter, uh, there's even black Twitter. Like there's all of these different subcultures. You can get inspiration from different subcultures around what content will actually work in a section of Twitter that nobody has seen before. So recently I've been doing a lot of like teardowns on like companies that have done amazing jobs at growing themselves from a B2B and SaaS and yep. SEO lens. Uh, and this was completely inspired by a thread that I saw in science Twitter where somebody broke down like Edison and how Edison came up with the light bulb and stole it from Tesla, blah, 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 blah. And their beef. And I was like, I could do this, but yeah. Stripe, I could do this, but about Canva, I could do this about et cetera. So I just took inspiration from a different world, applied it to my space and they've been taking off. How do you, how do you port yourself into different Twitter communities? Right? Because like yeah. you, you Twitter for 
unfortunately or fortunately is very much like an echo chamber of the people you follow, right? And I feel like you only truly get the, you know, like if say, like you said, uh, one of the cultures on Twitter is like around VC Twitter. I feel right. like you only really get the flavor of VC Twitter if you follow a bunch of people on VC Twitter. Yeah. If, if you're talking about like, you know, you you got inspiration from science Twitter, Right. What? How do you actually think about your strategy of like following or lists such that you can get visibility into communities that you're not normally a part of? Right. So Twitter lists are my go-to. So I set up Twitter lists um, specifically around experts. I'm a naturally just curious person. So I did this kind of not intentionally. I just like naturally was very interested in learning a lot about yeah. science. I set up another Twitter list that was about investing and that kind of built this whole mental model that is now being applied to the world of marketing. Um, all of this is essentially just a good old fashioned curiosity, but you can use Twitter lists to do that. And when you start to have Twitter lists and you start to browse them on a regular, you can start to get some interesting insights. Uh, on top of that, I think the other thing to leverage is Twitter search. And when you go to Twitter search and you start to type in keywords and you just start scrolling through and looking for things that um, are generating a lot of engagement, you can actually unlock some interesting insights and ideas there. Another thing that I oftentimes will do is I'll look at who other people are following and then just go down the rabbit hole. Um, I know it's easy to go down rabbit holes on Wikipedia, et cetera, but the best rabbit holes are on Twitter. When you start to go down Twitter rabbit holes, you start to uncover amazing people. Like I followed some people who have like 40 followers and they share some amazing content. Yep. You can get exposed to that. It just opens up your way of thinking, but it also gives you the opportunity to get inspiration for, for more content on your end. Yeah. I th again, I think there's so much good stuff here. I think one thing is the fact that like distribution strategy is so important and because not everyone truly understands distribution strategy, you can find amazing content with, from people who don't have large audiences, not yeah. because they're not talented content creators, exactly. but maybe, maybe you've caught them early on, or maybe they just haven't successfully distributed their content. So I think that's a key thing. I think the other thing is you clearly just take a very long game approach to thinking about content marketing because you know, there, I think step one after creating great content is this whole distribution strategy and building a process around, you know, the flywheel. But I think a lot of people would stop there and then never think about this idea of like, if you had a great original idea a yeah. year and a half ago, right. why not use that idea again if your audience has grown by 2x and half these people have never seen it? I think so few people think of this idea of repurposing content, not just on different channels, but also over different time periods. Exactly. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that happens in content marketing. Like we think once you press publish on a blog post, your job is done. It's not true. That's when the job actually begins. And then when people ask me like, what is the ratio for creation versus distribution in the first day, it's probably going to be 90% creation, 10% distribution, because on that first day, you're just going to share it on social. You're going to promote yep. it a little bit, et cetera. But on year two, it should be 10% creation, 90% distribution because time has passed. And over that time, you should have been promoting that piece of content every single month, every single week. Like you should be promoting it so yeah. much that the amount of time that you invested in it, distributing it goes far surpass the amount of two hours or four hours or 20 hours that it took to create that piece of content in the first place. You want to constantly be trying to skew your ratio on the end of distribution rather than creation because creation doesn't matter really like at the end of the day yeah. you publish if you create a piece of content and nobody reads it it's for nothing i remember when i first graduated from university i wrote an amazing piece of content i'm not humble enough to say that it wasn't amazing it was amazing <laughs> but it got two likes one was from my friend justin and one was from my mom it got no traction because all i did was put it up on my facebook account Nobody yeah. in my corporate world saw it. It didn't go out on LinkedIn because I had, I believe, and this is another thing that I truly believe. I believe that a lot of people don't distribute their content and even brands and CMOs don't distribute their content because of a fear of being judged. They have this innate fear of being judged negatively by their peers, of being that guy who's too promotional. We all see the threads all the time. Every other week, somebody's talking about how they hate Gary Vee for promoting yeah. too much. Like, Okay, sure. But guess what? You don't pay the bills by not promoting yourself. If you want to pay the bills, you have to get your content out there. If you want to pay the bills, you want to get your stories out there. Haters don't pay your mortgage. So folks, if you have a product that you forgot to promote or you haven't promoted recently because you know things got busy, life got yep. crazy, promote it. Promote it every single day because you're not you're doing you're doing a disservice to yourself. And 
the people who you could help if they found your content, right? Like if you promoted that great piece of content that you created and somebody's following you that is struggling with the problem that you could have helped them solve, you're doing a disservice to the people who you could help. Uh, so promote it and promote it regularly. You'll help the yeah. world if you do that. I, I, I think that's such an amazing point. And I think on the Gary V point, I, you know, I totally agree. Like people love to hate on him. Yeah. And first of all, by the way, this is uh you're you're able to make decisions for yourself. If you hate on him, just don't follow him. Right. Um but, but I think in, in terms of just his strategy for understanding how to scale his content, there are, there are very few people that I believe are better at that. Like he's built an incredible process around distribution and remixing of content. Um, what, one thing, one last thing I want to talk about before uh, we start taking questions from the audience, and we've already gotten a lot of questions, but for anyone who has questions, please just continue to submit them and we'll try to take as many as we can. So we, we just... We're in Professor Simmons' lecture on content marketing. Let's shift gears for five minutes to Professor Simmons' uh, class and lecture on search advertising and search marketing. Yeah. You recently wrote a piece about how Snowflake, uh, the you know the data company that just recently IPO'd, did an, an exceptionally good job of leveraging SEO and SE SEM. Yeah. Can you just walk me through how you think about SEO and SEM broadly and what stra strategies you think about that Snowflake deployed that we can all learn from? 100%. So I think one of the things that is often, again, underestimated in the wonderful world of marketing is the fact that this is a long game that you have to play. And one thing that Snowflake did early on that they recognized is the fact that people go to Google every single day to look for answers to problems. And when you understand the intent that somebody has when they go to Google, what they're trying to determine what they're trying to figure out. If you understand that, you can provide them with content that answers that question. You have a massive opportunity. The way that I view content and search as a whole is a fundamental understanding that every single human being who lives in essentially the first world and has access to the internet, has access to computers, uses Google to get answers to questions. Whether you're a, a grandmother, whether you're a toddler, you're maybe not a toddler, but if you're a five-year-old, like you're typically using Google to get answers to questions. So it starts with that fundamental understanding. And when you understand the fact that people are using search to get answers related to your product and related to problems that you solve, you want to create content that essentially solves those problems. Um, another great example of an organization that did this well was Canva. They recognized that every single month people were going to Google and they were typing in, how can I create a logo? How can I create an invitation or an invitation template, et cetera? So what did they do? They spun out a handful of pieces of content that answered that question and that query on Google. Every single asset that you publish when it is indexed in Google has value. What do I mean by that? There's typically going to be one of two things that can happen with a search. Either somebody is going to type in, what is a SaaS product uh, that can help me manage my social media distribution? Let's say that's what they typed into Google. They can click on an ad, which is going to cost $5, or they can click on an organic link that is just showing up because somebody did SEO, which is going to cost that company zero because it's already ranking. The value that you can extract as a marketer is directly related to the amount of people typing in a search term and then clicking on your content. If you are able to own the search engine results page for high value keywords, for example, if somebody's typing in cloud infrastructure, or if they're typing in lawyer in New York, or they're typing in um, CRM software, these are phrases that other brands are willing to pay to get that traffic. If you can rank for free by just pressing publish on a piece of content for a bunch of different keywords, the collective of those assets is valuable. And I believe the same way that you can have an economic moat, if you have a special know-how in your company, if you have a significant amount of unit value, um, if you have like state granted elements that kind of deter competition, if you can be early in creating a piece of content for a high value keyword and you rank number one or two or three, et cetera, but you're able to extract value from those searches, you have a competitive advantage over your competition. And that is an amazing opportunity because once that piece ranks number one, and if you are able to sustain it, you're able to essentially just print money day after day, month after month, because you own that phrase. Yeah. Um, this is why the Yelpification of B2B is so interesting. Long story longer, uh, just for a second here. So the Yelpification of B2B is this idea that 
um, sites like G2, Trust Radius, et cetera, are starting to create landing pages that are essentially saying, if you are a CRM software um, or looking for a CRM software, come to our website. Once you're on our website, you can look at a list of a bunch of these different pages. Guess what? Those pages are highly valuable. They're highly valuable because the person who's doing that search is going to swipe a credit card and pay yep. hundreds of thousands of dollars for a migration or a digital transformation within their company. If you can rank organically for those phrases and you can capture that value, you have an economic competitive advantage because you're able to print money off of the back of those search terms. So I think SEO, while it is very, like, I think a lot of folks uh, walk away from SEO because it's technical, it's kind of boring. We'd rather get the flashy viral dopamine hit of seeing a bunch of retweets yep. on Twitter, et cetera. But the long game is in SEO. And I think that that is oftentimes underestimated by so many marketers, um, but it's a yeah. huge way to build a, a moat around your business, I believe. And, and one other thing I'll add to that um, is that I think people feel like SEO is really daunting. Like, yeah. you know, if you are go to start deploying SEO as a strategy in your company, I think people start thinking about like, look at all these other companies in our space who have been doing SEO for literally decades. Uh, how are how are we going to possibly compete about these against these businesses? And yeah. how long is it going to take us to actually see value? Right. So, just, you know, just to use one real world example, let's talk about Morning Brew. Morning right. Brew, business news company. Uh, we send out a newsletter six days a week, and we have grown probably through all of the channels, paid and organic, uh, other than SEO. And right. the reason has been is generally we have been our content is in a newsletter, we've been email as a destination rather than email as content marketing back to our site. If we were to start thinking about how can we leverage SEO and site content to drive subscriptions for Morning Brew, how, like yeah. I think there's a daunting question of just like, where do you start? How would you start yeah. to think about this? So it would completely change the business um, for the good. Uh, like it starts with a fundamental understanding of, okay, what are the things that people are looking for when they have uh, interest and trying to get morning brew. So are they looking for marketing and content? Are they trying to look for finance content? Whatever that may be. And then I would go back to like the reverse engineer Sherlock Holmes yep. to kind of look at like who are the OGs in this space? One of the OGs in the world of like, let's say you're trying to attract finance people is Investopedia. Oh yeah. We're gonna, so we're gonna reverse engineer what Investopedia has done. One thing that they've done extremely well is they have created a collection of pieces of content that define keywords in finance. So. What does the opportunity like? You're going to have a very difficult time outranking them for yep. those types of phrases. You look at niche industries that are just starting to take off, but that you folks cover. I don't know if this is the true thing, but let's say you have a newsletter in the world of crypto. I would start defining every new phrase associated with crypto that nobody else has created yet. I've been preaching this for the last like three years. Nobody has done it yet, but like the brand who starts to do this now is going to have an amazing moat on keywords associated with cryptocurrency okay. come 10 years from now. Similarly, in the wonderful world of like marketing, you create definitions around marketing phrases, et cetera. What is this? What is that? Um, all of those keywords can do extremely well in terms of your opportunity to kind of get in front of people who are doing searches. Uh, but I think it fundamentally starts like you look at it the same way you would look at social from a top of funnel all the way through to the bottom of the funnel. So at the top of the funnel, sure, people are coming to your page because they're asking what is um, Bitcoin or what is Dogecoin, whatever that may be. That's top of funnel. Then at the bottom of the funnel, you need to create landing pages and assets that are going to be related to what are the best newsletters on yep. marketing, right? So you start to create those types of assets and then you make them the best on the internet. And how do you do that? You go to Google, you type in the best newsletters on uh, marketing, you look at the top five pages that are ranking, you create a spreadsheet and you write in your spreadsheet, what are the differentiating factors of these pieces? What are the similarities that these pieces have? And then you use that to inspire the content that you're gonna create that is gonna be better than all of them. Then. After you've done that, you're going to say, okay, none of these were really good. Maybe I should look at the D 2 C space and see what happens when I type in the best um, nail clipper. Oh, yep. this site called Wire Cutter shows up. Interesting. What's Wire Cutter doing talking about nail cutters? Then you read through and you start to realize they have videos associated with every single nail clipper that they're talking about. So what do you do? You start to create a video that goes with every single newsletter that you're talking about and reviewing, and then you have a piece that is better than everybody else in the industry. Yep. That's the game. That's the game. And when you do that, and you're number one, and you make it very difficult 
for somebody to compete and create something similar to you, that's when you differentiate from the competitors and that's when your moat gets even stronger from an SEO lens. That, that uh, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call live consulting. Uh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> CMO series. Yes. Uh, okay, so we're bumping up on time. I want to to finish with a rapid fire. Cool. Question from Jui is, where do we draw the line between promoting content constantly versus bombarding your audience with too much? Right, great question. So I go back to a fundamental um, belief in this thing called the three E's. And this was something that I learned very early in my career. I'm not sure if I coined it or if somebody else did, but it's this <laughs> idea of educate, engage, and entertain. So the three pieces of content that you should be creating back to back to back should fall into those three categories. If you're educating someone on a piece of content that you created, they're actually okay with you promoting that content. They're not gonna feel like you're bombarding them. They're not gonna feel like you shouldn't do that. If you throw in an engaging piece of content, which maybe it's something that's taking folks behind the scenes, showing yourself at a conference, showing yourself with family, showing yourself working from home, showing your new office setup, that is engaging content that makes people realize you're a human and you're not a robot behind the keyboard. That is content that people want. You throw in the mix just for icing on the cake, a little bit of entertainment, whether it's a meme, whether it's something that is witty, that is clever, et cetera, that type of content also will resonate with people. If you can create content that educates people, engages them, or entertains them, I guarantee you, you will not see a bunch of people start unfollowing you, unfriending you, and deleting you from their social media accounts. They will be, you will see a net new increase every single time if you commit to that type of content. And by the way, people unfollowing you isn't necessarily a bad thing. No. Right? Like if, if you are creating a specific type of content and you want a specific type of consumer and people unfollowing you are not that type of consumer, like yeah. you're actually potentially replacing higher quality customers and, and people in, in terms of the, the recipient of content you want with people that just weren't in your audience demographic. Exactly. Spot on. I always say like at the end of the day, I always find it interesting when you stumble across somebody who has like blocked you on Twitter, that's a sign that you're doing something right. Um, if you see that somebody has blocked you, it means you've you're doing something right, so lean into it. It's okay to get blocked a few times. Um, it's okay to get muted. It's okay to get unfollowed. It just means that that person wasn't gonna buy from you anyway. And as I said earlier, haters aren't gonna pay your mortgage anyway, so keep on going. Like keep For moving. sure. Yeah. Okay. La last question from Sarah. If cream is dead and it's now all about distribution, how does that affect the way content is made? Does it limit content creativity? Oh, thank you, Sarah, for asking this question. It speaks to my heart and I love it because at the end of the day, as much as cream, the idea is dead, you still fundamentally have to create content. Content shapes culture. Content at its core is one of the most influential and important things that we have in society. It shapes the way that we view the world as humans, and it has created everything around us, right? Right now, you're consuming content. You might have another tab open. Guess what's in that tab? Content. If you've reached within your arm's reach right now, you probably have a phone, and with that phone, you can consume more content or create content. Content connects us as people to each other. I truly believe that it is one of the most important things of society. It shapes our viewpoints, it shapes our perspectives, the stories that our parents tell us, the stories that teachers tell us. Content is very important. And with that comes a responsibility as marketers and as content creators to create content that adds value to the world. If you fundamentally understand the importance of creating content with value, to me, you're good. You're good, you're going, you have the fundamentals. You have the basics, right? You no longer need to be patted on the back for creating content because you already know that you have to create good content. I think it was an Eddie Murphy skit or someone who said, you don't get a pat on the back for saying, I'm a good kid, I raise my kids. I'm, you're supposed to do that, right? Like you're supposed to raise your kids. You don't get brownie points for doing that. The same way you don't get brownie points for creating valuable content. You're supposed to do that. That is our obligation to each other as humans to create valuable content for each other and content that helps each other get better. So once you get that, once you understand the fundamental value and commitment that you should have to others around you to create good content, the next step is to make sure that that story can reach as many people possible. And if you do that, you're off into the races. You've done your job, right? Like that's that's the that's the goal. 100%. Uh, yeah, Cut, creating valuable content will never go away. It's just more competitive to get that great content in front of people than ever before because that's uh, the beauty and the double-edged sort of technology. 100%. Uh, Okay, we are going to finish this thing with rapid fire. Ready to do this? Ready. In one word to one sentence, no more than one sentence, what is your one marketing superpower? Content distribution. 
that that makes sense. Uh, if I want one amazing resource on content marketing, what is it? It could be a read, a listen, a watch. Where should I go? Yeah, so I published this thing called the Distribution Challenge. I would strongly recommend that you check that out. Um, it's a 12-day course that just takes you through the distribution strategy and process. Awesome. And if I want one amazing resource on search engine marketing, what is it? Yeah, so I would go to a bunch of different sources. I'd go to the Moz blog or the Hrefs blog. Both of them have created great content and don't be afraid to go back into the archives circa like 2014. Great content over the years. Totally. Sometimes the oldest content is the most valuable content. It's why That's it's still another popular. cheat code to life that people yep. get. Yeah. 100%. Uh, who is your favorite follow on Twitter or LinkedIn? Ooh, great question. So I've uh, recently become a big fan of Trung Fan, uh, who yep. is from The Hustle. Uh, he does some great threads. Also a big fan of, um, oh, there's so many. I could go through names. Caitlin Bourjoin, she's great on Twitter as well. I probably messed up her last name and I apologize greatly if I did. Um, but yeah, I, you can follow anybody that I follow and they're probably going to be good people. Awesome. What is your favorite marketing channel right now and why? Good question. So my favorite channel right now has to be Twitter. Um, and the reason why is from a B2B marketing perspective, like it's a great place to just connect with good people and good vibes. Um, LinkedIn is slowly creeping back up my list. I had LinkedIn blacklisted for a while. Where I was like, uh, it's not doing anything, but when they changed the algorithm, the game changed and uh, you can connect with people all over the world. So I'm starting to love LinkedIn again. We're, uh, we're getting back on good terms. Awesome. Uh, two last questions. What is a channel that people don't give enough love to? Reddit. Reddit is, and this is mainly from a B2B lens too. Like a lot of B2B marketers think, oh, Reddit's for fun. People don't realize we're just like onions, like Shrek says, right? Like we we have layers. I might be wearing a suit in the boardroom, but yep. Sundays I'm scrolling through Reddit trying to see who I should start on my fantasy football lineup. And you can reach me on there. So uh, don't sleep on those channels. 100%. And the last question is, if people were to follow you on social, what could they expect to get from you in terms of value? Yeah, so you can expect just pure, real content. Like I don't really buy into the idea of kind of uh, growing and building without sharing. So I'm constantly just sharing my ideas, sharing my thoughts, giving as much value as possible. I tweet and share content about marketing, growth, SaaS, and once in a while I'll throw in a Fresh Prince or a 90s reference and that's just me being me. Um, but that's essentially me in a nutshell. I love connecting with people and having conversations. So um, that's essentially what I would share. Amazing. Well, Ross Simmons, Professor Simmons, this has been an unbelievable conversation. Uh, I have learned so much uh, about content marketing as well as search marketing. Thank you so much for being generous with your time. And uh, this was incredible. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me and appreciate all the work that you and the folks at Morning Brew are doing. Keep it up. Keep crushing it. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll connect again soon. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone to, uh, for joining the CMO series um, and for listening to Ross's incredible, insightful words. As always, we do this on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So join us whenever you want. And uh, this is going to help you up level in the world of marketing. Thanks so much for your time, everyone. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there. I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air.